um, I also got um, Alan in the call with me, and um, it's perfect that you just joined uh, because um, we got a question in the chat um, which asks us if you are already running a project in Africa. And I think that's a perfect question for you because, um, yeah, you got some information for us there, right? Sure. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Yannick, for taking over. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alan Ray, and I'm part of the technical sales team at Laureate. Just to quickly start on that question, we do actually have a system integrator, a few partners in Africa, um, one called Layer Free, who are a WAN management company. They work with a lot of the mobile operators in Nigeria and sort of further afield. And they would be able to, you know, help you build your solutions in Africa or manage networks within Africa. Um, and I'd be more than happy to introduce anyone who is interested in that region. We also have some other um, educational companies like Network for Learning who help in with IoT kits, proof of concepts, getting you started. And Laurie itself can obviously run workshops if you need any advice on, you know, um, any of the topics we cover today or LoRaWAN in general, network servers and so on. Good. So thank you, Yannick, for taking over. We'll, we'll carry on with the presentation. Um, in this section, I'd really like to kind of focus on best practices and steps to take into account when moving from POC to production. Um, so generally, we can say we have our gateways and devices and we're ready to deploy and our application is ready to kind of start ingesting data. But what about arguably the most critical component in a LoRaWAN network, the, the LoRaWAN network server? In this section, I want to focus on the most important server deployment model to meet those requirements and um, ensure that whatever those requirements are, we're using the appropriate server deployment for support good practices. And along the way, I also hope to sign, encourage some questions you guys can ask to service providers to avoid problems and errors arising in the short and long term. And I want to try and focus on uh, specifically, I don't want to focus specifically around Laureate services, but, you know, it's questions that we ask ourselves and our clients have asked us. And this kind of helps us to create products that are built around the best practices. And following that, we should have some time quickly to um, delve into the sometimes kind of forgotten connection, which is between the gateway and the network server and how picking the right software can help you sort of ensure you uh, follow good practices. Good. So we, we know there are kind of a number of solutions available in the market from gateway embedded systems to cloud and on-premise network servers, typically um, operating as a public or private network. And we kind of highly recommend the use of a centralized network server to manage and operate LoRaWAN networks. And there are typically several deployment models and commercial offerings which can support your requirements. So we've already seen there are community servers, professionally managed public servers, uh, and private network servers. Um, so let's explore a little more of these sort of three and how each one may um, best serve your use case. So when, when you're starting a new project or like a small proof of concept, you know, it's common sense to conduct initial end-to-end -end tests to validate that the solution is working uh, and assess, you know, the capability and the complexity of configuring the various components. Um, and at that, at that stage, validating the technology while keeping a low overhead is typically your primary concern. And it's perfectly pragmatic to connect your solution on a free, low-cost LoRaWAN network server. You know, a ready-to-go service will provide instant access and can kind of get you off the ground as, as quick as possible. Um, and as we mentioned, Laura enables this through our 13 worldwide public servers. Anyone can create an account for free and start, you know, connecting devices and gateways. Um, but, you know, it's also important to note that many public and free to use networks are kind of some, some are very basic in their implementation. Uh, and you may end up building additional services around it to compensate for the lack of features or some enforced limitations. And these limitations can hold you back the potential of your solution, you know, and cause maybe some unexpected headaches such as packet loss, um, unexpected message limitations, uh, and server downtime. So if you are starting out on a public server, which kind of, you know, makes sense initially, it's good to know what's in place, you know, what's the restrictions or any um, limitations. So, you know, I would ask uh, questions like, you know, what are the limitations of this server? Uh, what features are available or, or lack of that may hold back my test? And, you know, is this service reliable, even though it's a best effort? 
Um, and what really helps you out is obviously has this server got good documentation, has the software got good doc documentation, and what kind of level of free support will be included if you kind of run into any issues, okay? So let's um, kind of go to the next step now, which is really to call, focus on uh, you know, build, growing, running your proof of concept on a professional service, you know, because let's say upon a successful trial or starting to think about onboarding your first critical proof of concept or small commercial deployments uh, for a customer, you obviously want to um, ensure that you have a network server that's reliable and provides a guarantee of service. So, you know, when considering the network server is basically slotting into your solution, whoever is providing that service should you know, be improving your overall solution, not causing headaches and, and weakening it. And unfortunately, too many projects fail because of technical reliability or quality of service issues. And if, in, uh, if an end client experiences a lot of downtime, loss of data, a general feeling that um, technology is complex and underdeveloped, you know, obviously they're less likely to commission those, those next steps. And that's really where a professionally run service comes into play. Uh, and can provide a level of guarantee and capability to, you know, support your requirements. Um, and there are several options here with, um, you know, from SLA backed national and regional LoRaWAN network servers, city um, networks, and many of these are operated by LoRaWAN partners. Or where there isn't a locally available public in, uh, network, then you can always utilize the Laureate professional public servers and essentially connect your own gateways, your own devices, and you know build that connectivity for your solution. So yeah, we launched the professional public servers basically to provide a very feature rich, feature rich network server, which also includes an SLA and a backend um, architecture to kind of guarantee right reliability for your data. And it also provides a stepping stone for small and medium enterprises um, before scaling or the requirement of a private server is, uh, is needed. So um, very useful and can help you get started, help you like, you know, get from uh, PSC critical level proof of concepts um, to your next steps, which is like scaling out your deployments. But if you're looking at a professionally operated service, you know, they're all different. There's many shapes and sizes. Um, and I would generally want to ask, you know, does this service have a price feature level that suits your current needs? Um, what is the SLA? And more importantly, how does this sort of server architecture support this? So, you know, it's very nice saying it's a 99.9 .9 SLA, but you should really look at the back end and look at the architecture of the network, the network server itself and ask them for diagrams and so on, just which, which should support this SLA claim. Um, and what are the technical, what level of technical support is available? Um, and, you know, if the service is not uh, accessible, for example, how quickly can you get a response? And generally, you know, the LoRaWAN uh, ecosystem, it's very word of mouth. And, you know, just to ask around about what's the company's reputation, um, other solution prizes, what's their experience with a, a certain operator? And lastly, what's really quite important is that, is there a clear and flexible migration strategy in place that enables you to easily scale up without having to redo work? And th what this really means is that if you're starting on a professional run public server, what are your options for scaling? Can you, do you have to stay on that server? Is it easy to leave that server if you wanted to go onto your own private server uh, and so on? So that will kind of really touch into our, our next slide really, which is, you know, in some of these, um, if some of these answers that you get from these questions don't meet, meet your specification, it's probably likely that a private server will be what you're uh, looking for. So let's delve into private servers and we'll spend a little bit more time on this. And we're gonna go over really operating your solution or your, or your network on a private network server. So let's say the green light is given for a large deployment or maybe you have a number of smaller projects now ready to scale, or you want to build your own professionally run LoRaWAN network, that's also possible. Then there are, then what are your options, you know, and what deployment model fulfills one or even all of these requirements and will help us follow best, best practices for building our network? Well, like I say, you can continue to grow on, on many publicly, uh, professionally run public networks, but there's also another option, which is a really nice uh, feature of LoRaWAN, which is basically to have your own private LoRaWAN network servers. Uh, and there are many benefits to running and operating your own private server from a commercial, technical, and operational perspective. But what time uh, we have to focus on today, I'm going to just go over three that are typically not always considered, although you would expect them to be, which is um, con control, security, and uh, scalability. So let's look at control. Well, 
You know, with a private server, instead of being a tenant on a third party server, you can essentially run and operate your own private LoRaWAN network server. Um, and at LoRa, we, as we mentioned, provide this either as a fully managed software as a service model or professionally installed within um, and licensed within your own cloud infrastructure or, or on premise. And, you know, as essentially you own the server, you have full control over every device, every gateway. Uh, and tenant operating on that server. You you know you can also control the hosting location, the update schedule, who can access your server, uh, and if required, you can even uh, invite additional third parties to your server and resell your existing gateway connectivity, your server connectivity, and invite them to add their own gateways and you know build out the network um, for your own your own uh, infrastructure and them adding their own physical infrastructure. So, you know, it's very flexible. It's fully within your scope. And, and with our offering, there are no really no limitations in place, which some public or shared network operators may enforce. You know, they may have uh, message uplink downlink limitations. They may have certification programs that devices have to um, go through before they're allowed on the network and so on. So, you know, if you are looking at the private server and you want to think about control, um, I would ask them, you know, what are the limitations? Is there any kind of rigid procedures or additional requirements that I have to jump through? Um, and quite may probably the most important is, you know, who can access the server? And are you in complete control of its operation? And that kind of really goes into security, you know, which um, I also kind of consider privacy, you know, privacy of um, who can log into your server, who can see what's being connected on there and so on. So, you know, the first consideration for any deployment from the moment a first sensor is connected and the gateway is connected should be security. However, it's often only taken into consideration when deployment starts to scale or questions are starting to be asked by customers, you know, and building on insecure and basic platform might not be an immediate concern, but it typically ends with, you know, unforeseen problems and repeating efforts or even having, having to migrate to a completely new service. So the nice thing with a private server is you can, you can dictate the hosting environment. You can ensure, you know, your gateways are connected to your private instance and you control who can access them and if they're being used for roaming, for example. Um, you also typically have, you know, the top tier uh, admin access on the server to log into the admin interface where you can control user rights. Um, you can invite tenants, manage tenants, um, have a event overview of everything that's going up on, on the, um, network server. Um, and, you know, an enterprise grade server software should have the credentials to show that it's secure. You know, it, it has it got penetration tests and does it meet specification? Uh, and ultimately, you know, for your clients, you can prove you have integrated network server providing the best security practices and their data and privacy is valued. So some questions you may ask or some questions you, your customers may even ask you is, you know, is my data being forwarded to a secure server hosted in the same country? Um, what is the path of the data? And will the server hosting meet your corporate practices? You know, many organizations require uh, on-premise um, deployments. And if you're deploying your solution for them, can you do an on-premise um, deployment as well? You know, is that in your capability? If your solution's operating on a public infrastructure, then it's probably not gonna be able to do that. Um, and very first question you should always ask is, you know, what are the standard security practices in place that this software includes? You know, what's the rules around passwords, hardware authentication, user access rights, and so on. Um, and some examples we had actually uh, realized is, is companies who have been audited, uh, and then the come, you know, the organization that's audited them are, you know, petrochemical, pharmaceutical, public health, all those sort of stuff. You know, you have to have the credentials to show them that their data is being uh, looked after uh, and is secure. Very nice. So we've kind of covered those topics and we can now really go into scaling. And one of the advantages of a private network server is that you essentially have a, uh, a private server in place that ensures you have a long-term home to manage and, and operate your services. And, and even if at the very uh, early stages, you know, a very high SLA or um, high level of server redundancy isn't a primary concern. Um, there are from Laureate, you know, more basic private server architectures available. And at any point, if required, you know, for a higher SLA, you have more customers, more devices, more gateways connected to the server, then you can simply upgrade the backend architecture. And that's something we, we can do. And when I think about scaling, I typically say, you know, 
that saying what got you here might not get you there and you know what worked for proof of concept or low device numbers on a on a free or public platform might not work at scale so um if you look at the vendors def definitely ask you know does your private server offer flexibility on its architecture and sla um can i upgrade very easily um, what's a typical load a server can handle and that's a very difficult one to answer because it depends on how many devices and so on but it's good to get a ballpark uh, and do i have options to um do I have options to upgrade my server? Are there supporting architectures and documents and diagrams around it? That would be one of my primary concerns. So um, taking all that into account from day one, you know, it may just save you many, many hours and many thousands of euros looking, looking for the right model. Good, so I think uh, we've got just a few minutes maybe, I can just borrow a little bit more time just to kind of quickly go over um, one, area that's sometimes forgotten, you know, now we've kind of put some groundwork into the uh, server itself, we can um, discuss the gateway and network server integration. So, you know, ever since the LoRaWAN standard was first conceived, there's been a lot of focus about how security works in the end to end LoRaWAN data processing chain. And the main focus is usually on end nodes, typically sensors and the IoT application, you know, typically a web or mobile application. And it kind of ignores most of the middle components, the, the gateway and network server. And unfortunately, um, many vendors are still using a packet forwarder software that uses UDP, which is um, which randomly sends data packets or diagrams to a recipient without checking for missed packets. Um, it's typically used when error correction is not necessary, it results in unreliable delivery of data and a poor oversight of the health and connection of gateways. So, you know, this is what prompted us to build our own packet forwarder and gateway software, which in short, um, it adds many security layers, management tools, and uses a JSON-based protocol over TCP, which is a connection-oriented protocol, not UDP, which is connection-less. And, you know, in fact, I... I suspect that many users do not actually know they're losing packets with a UDP packet forwarder because it, it's generally not reported. Uh, and there's no real way for a server to know if a data was lost in transmission or at the backhaul to the network server. Um, and the nice thing is with our gateway software, any packet loss is reported, which can be debugged and fixed. And alongside this, you know, the server software is fully integrated with our user interface and um, REST API, and it provides convenient access to the gateway for, for any configuration. So, you know, we believe the extra effort of looking into Packet Forwarder is worth it if you're serious about your LoRaWAN deployment. Um, and when you are looking or speaking to vendors, you know, definitely question them about the, the gateway connection, the integration, the Packet Forwarder. Um, and I would ask, you know, what quality of services, uh, what quality of service features are available with that software, if any? Um, and also, how can we trust this gateway is connected to the server? You know, if it's just a single authentication, is mutual authentication? Does it, you know, for example, we offer gateway private key infrastructure, uh, and then what additional security layers are available on top? You know, is there transport layer encryption on top, um, and mutual authentication, and so on? So please, please, please look into the to the gateway side, um, the packet forwarder side as well. Um, so finally, um, you know, we've covered some brief some considerations for the network server and gateway, and I, I hope this will inspire more people to look deeper into these components and are uh, fully informed. You know, to build a LoRaWAN network and focus on the really important part, which is your actual services you wanna offer. So thank you for listening. And um, if you have any questions or would like more details, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, and I'll now pass back over to Yannick. Thank you very much for this um, very interesting presentation, Alan. And I see that we got quite some questions in the chat. Um, so one is, what do you think would be the best LoRaWAN manufacturer for wide range communication up to 20 uh, kilometers? Um, so if we're, we're talking at the hardware level with the gateway, there is, um, an, let's say there's sort of a number of players, the three big ones in the market are probably Multitech, Curlink and Tetelic. And then there's some very nice um, up and coming players such as Robusto, UrsaLink, uh, Ryzen HF, for example, and the, typically you want to look for a gateway that's obviously IP67 rated, so you can install it outdoors and you'll get the best coverage. The antenna is a big factor, but mostly what dictates is line of sight and height of placement. So all the different manufacturers have got their pros and cons, you know, some are more robust, some are more 
um, expensive, some are more feature rich, some are lower cost and so on. But um, yeah, I would, I'd recommend to start at those, those, those that I've mentioned. Um, any more questions, Yannick? We have? Yeah, um, uh, and I think when, when it comes to device vendors, it's really mm -hmm. dependent on the use case, right? So, um, yeah, really, uh, it depends on the, the use case you want to fulfill. Um, there are already quite a lot of different device vendors in the market where you can buy really industrial grade sensors off the shelf. And you basically just have to pick the right components, put them together like a, a puzzle piece, like puzzle pieces, and then you will be able to implement your use case. Absolutely. Um, and Nick wrote quite an interesting questions about uh, if we know initiatives um, or projects in the in the field of, of LoRaWAN, which mm -hmm. um, assist against this uh, COVID-19 epidemic. I think it's a very relevant topic. Absolutely. And I think, you know, um, IoT in general is in a really good position to help with this sort of scenario. And, you know, even after these events, it may really make us realize a bit that we need to work on automation and have processes that can be done remotely. And, and right now, you know, there's a lot of people who are isolated, who are in their buildings of all different ages. <clears throat> and, and there's solution companies, you know, I work with a company in the UK called Comms365 and another company called IOPT Assets, who basically do in-building monitoring, um, either a commercial level, but also at, you know, level for public housing, council housing, private housing, where, we're monitoring fuel poverty or what are the conditions within a house and so on and so on and if people are spending more time indoors then it's really important to have an oversight of um, these environments so people are not you know living in fuel poverty or bad conditions or there's mold growing in their in their buildings and so on and you know there's some examples of um, anonymous tracking of uh, people flow and locations and stuff like that so we can see high concentrations of people and where we could possibly deploy um, disinfection teams or cleaning teams or where we need to allocate resources and all that sort of stuff so I expect there'll be uh, hundreds of businesses you know thousands of businesses out there who are now already operating in IoT who will be coming up with some really uh, ingenious solutions for for tackling this and any sort of similar scenarios in the future. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, we have uh, one partner in Switzerland who has a really interesting, um, who brought up a really interesting solution based on LoRaWAN, which counts the, the people entering um, a room. And this is especially useful when it comes to counting people in uh, supermarkets or like, yeah, not restaurants, not anymore at the moment, but it was interesting for them as well. Mm -hmm. And it's based on a, a, a radar um, sensor which uses radar technology uh, to count the people entering a room and leaving the room. So there's definitely huge potential. And it's also perfect handover um, to my colleague, um, Carles, who will speak about um, like real world um, IoT use cases, which, are, which have been implemented um, by partners of us based um, on our network server. And he also has um, a use case in there, which could be very helpful when it comes to uh, fighting this um, COVID crisis. 